When I Was Dead by Vincent O'Sullivan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A.C. Bogus. When I Was Dead by Vincent O'Sullivan. And yet my heart will not confess he owes the malady that doth my life besiege. All's well that ends well. That was the worst of Ravenel Hall. The passages were long and gloomy. The rooms were musty and dull. Even the pictures were somber and their subjects dire. On an autumn evening, when the wind sowed and ailed through the trees in the park, and the dead leaves whistled and chattered while the rain clamored at the windows, small wonder that folks with gentle nerves went astraying in their wits. An acute nervous system is a grievous burthen on the deck of a yacht under sunlit skies. At Ravenel the change of nerves was prone to clash and jangle a funeral march. Nerves must be pampered in a tea-drinking community, and the ghost that your grandfather, with a skin full of port, could face and never tremble sets you, in your sobriety, sweating and shivering, or becoming scared, poor ghost, of your bulged eyes and dropping jaw. He quenches expectation by not appearing at all. So I am left to conclude that it was tea which made my acquaintance afraid to stay at Ravenel. Even Wilvern gave over and as he is in the guards and a polo player, his nerves ought to be strong enough. On the night before he went, I was explaining to him my theory, that if you play some drops of human blood near you, and then concentrate your thoughts, you will after a while see before you a man or a woman who will stay with you during the long hours of the night, and even meet you at unexpected places during the day. I was explaining this theory, I repeat, when he interrupted me with words, senseless enough, which sent me fencing and parrying strangers on my guard. I say, Alistair, my dear chap, he began, you ought to get out of this place and go up to town and knock about a bit. You really ought, you know. Yes, I replied. And get poisoned at the hotels by bad food and at the clubs by bad talk, I suppose. No, thank you. And let me say that your care for my health enervates me. Well, you can do as you like, he said, rapping with his feet on the floor. I'm hanged if I stay here after tomorrow. I'll be staring mad if I do. He was my last visitor. Some weeks after his departure, I was sitting in the library with my drops of blood by me. I had got my theory nearly perfect by this time, but there was one difficulty. The figure which I had ever before me was the figure of an old woman with her hair divided in the middle, and her hair fell to her shoulders, white on one side, black on the other. She is a very complete old woman, but alas, she was eyeless and when I tried to construct the eyes, she would shrivel and rot in my sight. But tonight I was thinking, thinking, as I had never thought before, and the eyes were just creeping into the head when I heard the terrible crash outside as if some heavy substance had fallen. Of a sudden the door was flung open and two maidservants entered. They glanced at the rug under my chair, and at that they turned a sick white, cried on God, and huddled out. How dare you enter the library in this manner? I demanded sternly. No answer came back from them, so I started in pursuit. I found all the servants in the house gathered in a knot at the end of the passage. Mrs. Pebble, I said smartly to the housekeeper, I want those two women discharged tomorrow. It's an outrage. You ought to be more careful. But she was not attending to me. Her face was distorted with terror. Ah, dear, ah, dear, she went. We had better all go to the library together, says she to the others. Am I master of my own house, Mrs. Pebble? I inquired, bringing my knuckles down with a bang on the table. None of them seemed to see or hear me. I might as well have been shrieking in the desert. I followed them down the passage and forbade them to enter the library. But they trooped past me and stood with a clutter round the hearth rug. Then three or four of them began dragging and lifting, as if they were lifting a helpless body, and stumbled with their imaginary burthen over to a sofa. Old Soames, the butler, stood near. Poor young gentleman, he said with a sob. I've knowed him since he was a baby. And to think of him being dead like this and so young, too. I crossed the room. What's all this, Soames? I cried, shaking him roughly by the shoulders. I'm not dead. I'm here. Here. As he did not stir, I got a little scared. Soames, old friend, I called. Don't you know me? Don't you know the little boy you used to play with? Say, I'm not dead. Soames, please, Soames. He stooped down and kissed the sofa. I think one of the men ought to ride over to the village for the doctor, Mr. Soames, 
said Mrs. Pebble, and he shuffled out to give the order. Now this doctor was an ignorant dog, whom I had been forced to exclude from the house because he went about proclaiming his belief in a saving God, at the same time that he proclaimed himself a man of science. He, I was resolved, should never cross my threshold, and I followed Mrs. Pebble through the house, screaming out prohibition. But I did not catch even a groan from her, not a nod of the head, nor a cast of the eye, to show that she had heard. I met the doctor at the door of the library. Well, I sneered, throwing my hand in his face, have you come to teach me some new prayers? He brushed by me as if he had not felt the blow, and knelt down by the sofa. Rupture of a vessel on the brain, I think, he said to Soames and Mrs. Pebble after a short moment. He has been dead some hours, poor fellow. You had better telegraph for his sister, and I will send up the undertaker to arrange the body. You liar, I yelled. You whining liar. How have you the insolence to tell my servants that I am dead when you see me here face to face? He was far in the passage, with Soames and Mrs. Pebbles at his heels, ere I had ended, and not one of the three turned around. All that night I sat in the library. Strangely enough, I had no wish to sleep, nor during the time that followed had I any craving to eat. In the morning the men came, and although I ordered them out, they proceeded to minister about something I could not see. So all day I stayed in the library or wandered about the house, and at night the men came again, bringing with them a coffin. Then, in my humor, thinking it a shame that so fine a coffin should be empty, I lay the night in it and slept a soft, dreamless sleep, the softest sleep I had ever slept. And when the men came the next day, I rested still, and the undertaker shaved me, a strange valet. On the evening after that, I was coming downstairs when I noted some luggage in the hall, and so learned that my sister had arrived. I had not seen this woman since her marriage, and I loathed her more than I loathed any creature in this ill-organized world. She was very beautiful, I think, tall and dark and straight as a ramrod, as she had an unruly passion for sandal and dress. I suppose the reason I disliked her so intensely was that she had a habit of making one aware of her presence when she was several yards off. At half past nine o'clock, my sister came down to the library in a very charming wrap, and I soon found that she was as insensible to my presence as the others. I trembled with rage to see her kneel down by the coffin, my coffin, but when she bent over the kiss to pillow, I threw away control. A knife which had been used to cut string was lying upon the table. I seized it and drove it into her neck. She fled from the room screaming. Come, come, she cried, her voice quivering with anguish. The corpse is bleeding from the nose. Then I cursed her. On the evening of the third day, there was a heavy fall of snow. About eleven o'clock, I observed that the house was filled with blacks and mutes and folk of the country who came for the obsequious. I went into the library and sat still and waited. Soon came the men, and they closed the lid of the coffin and bore it out on their shoulders. And yet I sat feeling rather sadly that something of mine had been taken away. I could not quite think what. For half an hour, perhaps, dreaming, dreaming, and then I glided to the hall door. There was no trace left of the funeral, but after a while I sighted a black thread winding slowly across the white plain. I'm not dead, I moaned, and rubbed my face in the pure snow and tossed it on my neck and hair. Sweet God, I'm not dead! The End of When I Was Dead